This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Today we're gonna to look at a very popular mathematical question, and that is, is there some sort of three-dimensional analog to the complex numbers? And so if you look at the complex numbers over the real numbers, you'll probably know that it is a like two-dimensional object built out of the real numbers. You have a real axis and an imaginary axis. Its spanned or its basis is the number one and the imaginary unit i. And so it stands to reason that an interesting question would be, is there a three-dimensional version of that? Well, before we like look at that question a little bit more carefully, let's see some properties that the complex numbers have so that we have some properties in mind that our new object should have. Well, let's recall that the complex numbers is the set of everything of the form a plus bi, where a and b are real numbers, and importantly, i is the square root of minus one, so i squares to minus one. And the complex numbers has the following properties. Well, it's a two-dimensional extension of the reals. That's pretty clear by the definition right here and by our previous discussion. And it's also a field. So by a field, I mean a mathematical object where multiplication and addition works in a way that's fairly similar to how you think it should work. In particular, every non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse. But maybe a weaker condition than that would be to say that the complex numbers does not have zero divisors. So a zero divisor is a number so that if you multiply it to another number and you get zero, well, one of them may not be zero originally. And so saying that there are no zero divisors means if a times b is zero, then a is zero or b is zero. I've got a whole video on zero divisors if you'd like to check that out. So another property of the complex numbers is that the multiplication is commutative and associative. And so for our purposes, we will want our new structure to have, well, almost all of these properties right here. The only property that will loosen is the commutativity. But along the way, we'll see what structure we get if we add commutativity back in. Okay, so here's the main result which we will prove, and here this is also maybe known as Frobenius' theorem, although there are many theorems called Frobenius' theorem, and I'm following notes from a lecture given by Michael Barr. And so I think if you just Google Frobenius' theorem and then complex numbers and Michael Barr, you could probably find these notes pretty easily. Okay, so the claim says this. The only finite dimensional algebras over R without zero divisors are the real numbers themselves, the complex numbers, and, well, this thing that I've called H, but the H is the quaternions or Hamilton's quaternions. And I've really underscored the fact that we want associativity here. Sometimes that's built into the definition of an algebra, but just to be clear, we want an associative algebra. Okay, so let's notice that if we were to restrict ourselves here to have an associative and commutative algebra, then we lose the Hamiltonians because those are no non-commutative, and we only get R and C. Now importantly, R is one-dimensional, C is two-dimensional. Well, nothing there is three-dimensional. And if we loosen it and keep the quaternions, those are four-dimensional. Well, again, nothing's three-dimensional. So the answer is no, there are no three-dimensional complex numbers, but this will show that. Okay, let's get to it. Before we continue, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is a service that takes the hassle out of creating a website. You don't have to be a programmer or a graphic designer to have a professional looking website. Because of their support, I can dedicate all my spare time to doing the things I love. With Squarespace, you too can focus on what's important to you and leave the technical stuff to them. With the new Fluid Engine, you have complete control over the structure of your website. The simple drag and drop action will help you get your site online quickly and access to analytics will help you tailor your content to your audience. I use Squarespace for my website and I find it easy to use with plenty of integrations. 
They even have a plugin for LaTeX that allows me to write equations very easily. Whether you need a place to sell your merch or show your art, Squarespace has the tools you need to keep your website modern and easy to use. So what are you waiting for? Give Squarespace a try by going to squarespace.com slash Michael Penn to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain using code Michael Penn. Thanks once again to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video that we are now returning to. So let's let A be our algebra. So in other words, we have A is an n-dimensional algebra over R without zero divisors. You know, like our rule up there says that we must have. Okay, so now we're gonna prove this in some steps. The first step will be that A has a multiplicative identity. So in order to do this, we will use the fact that the multiplication is associative along with a lot of the unsaid things here about the distributive rule and all of that to say that we have a linear transformation. Okay, so let's get at it. So let's take any non-zero element A from A and maybe define the following map. I'll call it L sub A and it'll go from A to A and it'll be defined by L sub A operating on X is equal to A times X. So that's just the left multiplication map. But again, by our assumptions up here about being an algebra and being an associative and all of that kind of stuff, we know that L sub A is a linear transformation. So since it's a linear transformation, well, first of all, it can be expressed as a matrix. But what we really need is to use all of the powerful tools of linear algebra. So let's do that. So it's a linear transformation from A to A. Furthermore, since there are no zero divisors, its null space is trivial. So let's note that here, that the null space of L sub A is equal to the zero vector. And if you're like a little bit worried about that, we can prove why that is the case really, really quickly. So if, B is inside the null space of L sub A. That means that L sub A evaluated at B is equal to zero, but that means that A times B is equal to zero. But since A is non-zero and we do not have zero divisors, that means that B is equal to zero. So that's really all we need to do to show that the null space is equal to zero. But if the null space is trivial, it's equal to zero, and we're going between A and A, then this must be a surjective or an onto function. So since it's onto, we can find something that gets mapped, well, to anything we want. And what do we want to get mapped to? Well, how about the, the element A? So that implies there exists something that I'll call E in A, such that L sub A on E is equal to A. So E is that pre-image of A. Okay, but now let's rewrite that with our left multiplication. That means that A times E is equal to A. Well, so E is having this property when it's being multiplied by A that looks like an identity property. Now, what we wanna show is that E is an identity for everything. So let's get there. So let's suppose we've got some other element, which I'll call B in A, and let's look at the following calculation. So A times B is the same thing as A times E times B, you know, by this rule right here. But now we can move some things around and see that that shows that A times B minus EB is equal to zero. You know, just subtracting over and then factoring out an A. But again, we don't have zero divisors here. And since A is non-zero, that means that this thing that I'm underlining in red must be equal to zero. But if that must be equal to zero, then that means that B is equal to E times B. But that was for some arbitrary B in A. So what we have here is if we left multiply by E to anything in A, it doesn't change. In other words, E is a left identity of A.
Now, what we really want is it to be a two-sided identity, but we can get there pretty easily. And we can do that by really like starting this whole argument over from this spot right here. So let's start it over from this spot right here and define a new map, which I'll call R sub A, which goes from A to A, which is, well, you guessed it, it's right multiplication by A. So R A evaluated at X equals X times A. But now everything follows just like it did before. So R sub A is a linear transformation. Since there are no zero divisors, it is, um, its null space is zero. It must be surjective because its null space is zero. That means there's something that must get mapped to A. So let's skip to that part. So there exists something that I'll call E prime in A such that R sub A of E prime is equal to A. But now let's note that that means that, well, let's see, what is it? It will be E prime times A is equal to A. But now again, we can do something fairly similar to this line right here to end up with the following rule. And that is that E is E prime, I should say, is a right identity. Great. So just filling in very, very similar details to this. And now our next goal is we want E and E prime to be the same. So our left identity is exactly the same as our right identity. And this is pretty straightforward. We have E is the same thing as E times E prime. That's because E prime is a right identity, but that's the same thing as E prime because E is a left identity. So that means the left identity and the right identity are the same. So that means we have something which is most definitely just an identity. And now let's rename that to just the number one. So that's our renaming there. So we've shown that A has a multiplicative identity and now we have called it the number one. Furthermore, we can look at the span of this number one, which is a subspace of A, and that subspace is exactly equal to the real numbers. So what we have here is like a copy of the real numbers living inside our algebra. So that's good because our algebra should be some sort of extension of the real numbers, which means it should definitely contain the real numbers. Okay, let's move on to the next step. Of course, something that goes hand in hand with a multiplicative identity is the notion of multiplicative inverses. And that's the second step here. We'll show that every non-zero element of A has a multiplicative inverse. And this is like pretty straightforward. So let's take that map LA from A to A again, which recall that was defined by LA operating on X equals A times X. And that was like a surjective map by our previous argument. And so since it's a surjective map, then that means we can land on any element of A we want. But now we'd like to land on that multiplicative identity that we showed must exist last time. So there exists something that I'll call maybe A prime, such that LA on A prime is equal to one, but that means that A times A prime is equal to one. But what does that mean? That means that A prime is essentially just A inverse. So there we have it. We have a multiplicative inverse for every non-zero element. Okay, so all of that is like kind of warm-up type stuff. Now we need to get into the meat of the argument. Before we really move on, I'd like to make a little bit of an observation. And that is, if the dimension of A is 1, then A is the same thing as the real numbers. But if it's the same thing as the real numbers, then we're done, because that's in our list right here. So now let's suppose that the dimension of A is bigger than or equal to two. And let's recall it's got a one dimensional subspace, which is the real numbers. And we just called that the real numbers. Okay, so if the dimension is bigger than or equal to two and the real numbers is just a one dimensional subspace, that means we can find something outside of the real numbers. And that'll be something very useful to work with here. So let's take our element X outside of the set of real numbers, but inside of A. Again, that's possible because this dimension of A is bigger than or equal to two from here on out. 
And then what we want to do now is look at the subalgebra of A that is generated by X. So I'm going to write it like this. So we've got R maybe a join X. And this will be, well, it's going to look like just a space of polynomials in X, but that's really not exactly what it is. But let's write it out like this. So we've got A0 plus A1 times X all the way up to A sub M times X to the M, where AI is a real number. Maybe for the purposes of what's coming up later, I'll say that is A sub K is a real number. So again, that's the subalgebra of A that's generated by this X right here. And now we're gonna use some facts about polynomials over real numbers. And the most important thing we need here is that the maximum degree of an irreducible polynomial over the real numbers is degree two. So what that means is that this X satisfies or is a root of either a degree one polynomial or a degree two polynomial over R, I should say. So let's note that X cannot be root of a linear polynomial. And that's because if so, that means that X would be inside of A, which is a clear contradiction because that's what we've assumed is not true here. So if it's not a root of a linear polynomial and well, all the polynomials kind of above that are just quadratic polynomials over R I should say, then that means that X is a root of an irreducible quadratic polynomial. So in other words, we have X squared plus 2BX plus C equals zero. And this is with B squared minus C less than zero. So this is like a cheeky little way of writing the quadratic formula here, but I've scaled this so that this term right here is like quite nice. That's the discriminant that's inside of the quadratic formula. So the stuff under the square root. So this over here, just to reiterate, is the condition that this is an irreducible quadratic polynomial. If it's not an irreducible quadratic polynomial, then it can factor into linear polynomials. But then again, since we've got a space without zero divisors, that means X would be a root of one of those linear polynomials. Okay, so anyway, we get to this right here. Okay, nice. But what does that tell us? That tells us, first of all, that the dimension of R of X is equal to two. And that's because we don't really need X squared because we can always rewrite X squared as, well, in this case, it'll be negative two BX minus C. So in other words, we have R adjoin X is really just like, I'm gonna write something fancy here, the direct sum of R with R X. So like I said, it's two dimensional. That's kind of neither here nor there at this point though. Okay, so now let's maybe see where we can go with this with some simplification in mind. So let's set Y equal to X plus B. Notice that that means X is equal to Y minus B. So this is like a change of basis for our uh, subalgebra R adjoin X. And now let's plug this into our quadratic polynomial that is satisfied by X. So we have zero is equal to X squared plus two BX plus C is equal to Y minus B squared plus two B times Y minus B plus C. Okay, nice. But now that simplifies down to y squared minus b squared plus c. So in other words, since this is equal to zero, we have y squared is equal to b squared minus c, which is less than zero. I guess another thing to point out here, which I think I did in words, but I didn't write down, is that this subalgebra r adjoin x is the same thing as the subalgebra r adjoin y. Like I said, this is just a change of generating vectors or like a change of basis, if you will. Okay, so now let's look carefully at this. Our subalgebra is now generated by a single vector y, and y satisfies this rule that when you square it, you get a negative real number. Recall that b and c here are just real numbers. 
So now let's scale this a little bit. Let's set, I'm gonna call it i equal to one over the square root of c minus b squared times y. So this may seem a little bit sketchy, but this is totally allowed because c minus b squared is positive from this formula right here. But now let's square y, and using all of this construction, we'll see that i squares to minus one. But, you know, just extending this off here, we have r adjoin x is the same thing as r adjoin i, but since i squared is minus one, that's simply the complex numbers. So we have this is the complex numbers. So if the dimension of a is two, then that means we're done. We found everything because we can't pick anything outside of this. And that being said, if the dimension is two, well, we're done. And we've shown that it's the complex numbers. So we have this case right here. So that means that to keep going, we'll need to assume there's something else. And that's exactly what we'll do now. So we've done a medium amount of work so far. We showed that if the dimension of A was one over the real numbers, then A was just the real numbers. I think that's pretty clear. If the dimension of A was two, then A was simply the complex numbers. And of course, that's only with the assumption that we don't have zero divisors. But that's two of our possibilities here, two out of our three possibilities. So from here on out, we wanna assume that the dimension of A is bigger than or equal to three, and show that all of those possibilities will collapse to this last case of Hamilton's quaternions. Okay, so let's do that. So the important thing that we'll use here is a new map, and that new map is called sigma. And so we're gonna define sigma from A to A. So this is gonna be a linear transformation. Again, maybe I'll leave it as a homework exercise to check that it's a linear transformation. And a linear transformation from a space to itself is known as an endomorphism for what it's worth. I know that I always liked learning words when I was a student, so if you guys haven't heard that word, endomorphism. Okay, so how do we define this? So sigma evaluated at x will be minus i x times i. I guess importantly, this is just i inverse times x times i. It's pretty easy to show that i inverse is negative i. So not only is it a linear transformation, but it's in fact like a homomorphism of the algebra. That means it uh, satisfies some nice rules that have to do with multiplication inside of the algebra. Let's check those real quick. Let's look at sigma of x times y, which is minus i times xy times i. But now let's insert a one in between xy, but it'll be in a special form. We have minus i x i, and then minus i y i. So in the middle there, we have i times minus i, which is one. So nothing has changed, but now we can write this as sigma x sigma y. So now it's not just a linear transformation from a to a, but it's a algebra homomorphism from a to a. Okay, great. And now, since in this setup, we're assuming that the dimension of A is bigger than or equal to three, that means we can find something outside of, let's see, the complex number world here, but inside of A. So let's take, well, maybe we'll call it X. And so this is an A, but outside of that complex number world. I'm gonna call it C but let's recall that it was r adjoin i, where we did a lot of work to construct that i before. But now let's notice this. So let's notice that c is contained inside of c adjoin x, which is contained inside of I, a. So that gives us an algebra that lives between c, which is r adjoin, a, which is r adjoin i and the whole algebra there. And now we're gonna prove the following claim, which will like point us in the direction of the quaternions. And that is that xi cannot equal i times x. In other words, if we're outside of this complex number subalgebra, you do not commute with the complex unit i. Okay, so how does this proof go? Well, we're gonna do it by contradiction. So let's suppose that in fact xi is equal to ix. 
But the important thing about that is that xi to the maybe m power is x to the m times i to the m for all m, which this doesn't work if you do not have commutativity. And then let's look at a polynomial. So we'll call it p of z, which is inside of c adjoined z, so the polynomial ring, which is satisfied by x. In other words, what I mean by satisfied by x, I mean x is a root of that polynomial. So let's write that out. So that means p of x is equal to zero. Oh, but like the really important thing here is that over the complex numbers, every polynomial factors into linear factors. So this factors like z minus alpha one times z minus alpha two, all the way up to z minus alpha m. But if p times x is equal to zero, then that means x must be one of these alphas. That follows because we don't have zero divisors. So let's see, that means that x is equal to alpha j for one of these j's, but that alpha j is inside of the complex numbers. Oh, but look, we assume that x was outside of the complex numbers here, so that gives us a contradiction. So, like, the important takeaway here is that xi is not equal to ix. We don't have commutativity in the rest of our extension. Okay, so let's see where that takes us. Okay, so we just introduced this map, and we showed that if x was outside of the complex numbers but inside of our algebra, then xi was not equal to ix. Where, of course, when I'm saying complex numbers, I mean the reals adjoin that imaginary unit that we constructed earlier. Okay, so now let's notice the following, and I think this is uh, fairly straightforward to notice, and that is, r adjoin i, which we've been calling c, is simply equal to all x in a, such that sigma of x is equal to x. Okay, good. And you might say, well, why is this true? Well, if we have x not inside of c, then sigma of x is equal to x, will in fact imply that xi is equal to ix, which would be a contradiction. So it really all comes down to this non-commutativity of our setup right here. So I think that's pretty interesting. And now we're gonna introduce another subalgebra, and I'll call that subalgebra b. So let's set b equal to all of the elements x in a, such that sigma of x is equal to negative x. So this is interesting right here. We have everything that has eigenvalue one and everything that has eigenvalue minus one of this map sigma. And now let's notice the following. If we have y inside of a, then we can write y in the following way. It is equal to one half times y minus sigma of y plus one half times y plus sigma of y. Okay, so I think that's pretty cool. But the interesting thing here is if we take this object right here and apply sigma, we get sigma y minus sigma squared of y, but sigma squares to the identity operation. You can check that. But that means we're gonna pick up a minus sign. But that means that this thing right here is an element of b. And likewise, if we apply sigma to this, we'll just pick up the thing that we started with. Oh, but that means that thing is inside of C. So that means we have Y can be written as a sum of elements of B and elements of C, but also elements of B and elements of C do not overlap. But since every A can be written like that, that means that A indeed decomposes as this direct sum. This direct sum of everything in B with everything in C, which recall was our R adjoin I. Okay, so this is where we were. We were able to decompose A into B plus C, where B and C were defined as follows, although we don't really need to define those complex numbers. That was R adjoin, our original imaginary unit. Okay, so now let's take an element which I'll call little b in b. 
But notice since little b is in b, that means that b is inside of a minus r. That's because b is most definitely a subset of a minus r, given that r is inside of this complex number subalgebra right here. Okay, but that means we can do some sort of modification using the first couple of steps that we did before to shift and scale b until it's equal to j. So we've got a j in b such that j squared is equal to minus one. So again, that's just kind of repeating that whole process from the first couple of steps. Okay, so now let's consider a new map. I'll call it tj. And what it does is it goes from A to A, and it's simply left multiplication by J. So TJ on X is just J times X. But now I'd like to notice that if X is inside of B, and that means that sigma times JX is equal to sigma times J times sigma times X, which is equal to, well, j is inside of b and x is inside of b. So this is minus j times minus x, which is equal to j times x. Oh, but look, we've got sigma times jx is just equal to jx, but that means that tj evaluated at x is inside of c. So in fact, what happens is tj takes elements from this subspace b and sends them to our copy of complex numbers. Okay, and then similarly, if x is inside of c, then that means that sigma of jx is equal to, again, sigma of j, sigma of x. We proved that that worked before, which is now equal to minus j times x. Because since x is in c, it gets fixed by sigma. But this tells us that tj of, of x is inside of b. And then one more thing to notice is that if you apply tj to itself four times, you get the identity. That means that tj is invertible. Okay, so let's lay out what we have here. So we have c here and we have b here. And between c and b, we create everything in our algebra a. And then going from C to B, we've got an invertible map TJ. And going from B back to C, we have, well, the same invertible map TJ. But the important thing is that it's an invertible map. And since the dimension of C over R is two, then the dimension of B over R is also two. So here we've got the dimension of B is equal to two. Oh, but if the dimension of B is equal to two, then the dimension of A is equal to two plus two, which is four. So we have the dimension of A is equal to four. Oh, but look, we skipped over three, so we've answered this question right here. All that's left is to show that this four-dimensional algebra is in fact the quaternions. So let's do that. So the end is within sight. What we've done is shown that if the dimension of A over the real numbers is not one or two, which gave us these first two cases, then the dimension had to be four. But along with the dimension being four, we had the following three independent vectors. One, which is the identity. We had I, which squared to minus one. And we had another one, J, which also squared to minus one. And furthermore, we knew that IJ was not equal to JI. But then let's also recall that J was in the subspace that when it got operated on by sigma, it got turned negative. In other words, sigma of J equals minus J. But let's notice that sigma of j was defined to be minus i times j times i, that's equal to minus j. Now we'll left multiply by i and notice that this turns into j times i equals minus i times j. So that gives us the classic commutativity rule between i and j. Okay, so next up we want to include a new vector, which I'll call k, which is simply the product of i and j, which of course we've played with a little bit. So now let's notice that that gives us one, two, three, four independent vectors inside of A. That means that A can be spanned by these four independent vectors. Now let's find some rules that K must satisfy. 
let's notice that k squared is equal to ij ij, but let's switch those middle i's and j's and get i times negative i times j times j, but in the end that gives us minus i squared j squared which equals minus one. So we have k squared is also minus one. Let's also notice that i times j times k, well that's simply equal to k squared again which is minus one. Okay, so let's see what we have in the end. So we'll put it in this box down here. We have a is everything of the form a plus bi plus cj plus dk, where a, b, c, and d are simply real numbers. And then i squared equals j squared equals k squared equals i times j times k equals minus one. But that's the exact description of the quaternions. And so that finishes everything off. So the only finite dimensional algebras over the real numbers without zero divisors are the real numbers themselves, the complex numbers, or the quaternions. Really underscoring this fact that there are no three-dimensional complex numbers if we want them to have some nice properties like we described over here. Now, if you've stuck around this long, thanks. And consider subscribing. It would really help out the channel. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpinmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.